Software and Security Engineering, Lecture 10, First Segment. In this last lecture of the course, I'm going to um, talk about tools and methods, because these are, in some sense, the core of software engineering. And what do we mean uh, by tools and methods in this context? Well, um, in general, uh, we um, human beings invent and use tools when some parameter of a task exceeds our native capacity. And although some animals uh, other than humans use tools, we are really preeminent in our ability to invent tools and extend our capabilities. So if we, you come across a heavy object, a large stone that you want to move, um, you invent the lever so that you can raise it. And if you come across a tough object like a tree trunk, uh, you invent an axe so you can cut it, or perhaps you uh, get rid of it using fire. And the past um, 10,000 years have been a story of our coming up with more and better tools to tackle uh, a, a huge variety of tasks. Now, software engineering tools, this is the key insight, are about dealing with complexity. What do we mean by that? Well, there's two types. First is the incidental complexity, which is what we struggled with in the early days. So, for example, in my first proper program programming job, we were writing... Um, avionics um, software and machine code and we put an awful lot of effort into tra keeping track of uh, which variable was at which address and bugs arose all the time if you used the wrong variable for the wrong purpose and the solution to this was high level languages. However the main problem today is intrinsic complexity. Um, something like a bank is an immensely complex um, human um, organization. Um, you have got hundreds of products, you have got hundreds of bank branches, you have got tens of thousands of staff, you have got thousands of developers working to maintain the software, which is the bank's main non-interest cost. And it's all so big and so messy that no individual human being can understand it all. And the solution, if that is the right word, are techniques such as structural development and project management tools that we've um, touched on at various times during this course and which I'm going to discuss more systematically now. And one of the uh, key insights here is that you can aim to eliminate the incidental complexity, but the intrinsic complexity has got to be managed. Now, incidental complexity um, was um, the first thing that people tackled, and the biggest thing that people did to deal with it was producing high-level languages like Fortran. Now, you've uh, got another course in uh, programming languages, and so you're hearing the story of Fortran and COBOL and ALGOL and Pascal and so on. Um, what do these languages do? Well, first, productivity, because if you can do 2,000 lines of code per developer a year, that goes an awful lot faster in Fortran than it does assembler. The code's easier to understand and maintain, because you're using appropriate abstractions, data structures, functions, and objects rather than bits, registers, and branches. And the structure lets many errors uh, be found at compile time. And as languages have acquired more structure, as you move from um, Fortran to Pascal, for example, and then to Java, then potentially more errors can be um, found in this way. What's more, the code can be portable, at least large chunks of it, uh, can be portable and the machine specific details can be contained into a few small units, device drivers, interfaces, whatever. So for example, um, as one of our research projects, we um, ported FreeBSD to a new CPU which our postdocs and research students have built and that task involved um, a number of people in about two months of work. And had we had to write a new operating system from scratch, that would have um, or taken perhaps um, half a dozen research students three years to do. So it's an enormous benefit when you can reuse code. And code reuse is one of the things at the core of software engineering. Now, um, what do you get from having high-level languages? Well, there's a performance uh, gain of about five to ten times. And as coding is about a sixth of the cost, remember our lecture on software engineering economics, this means that better languages give diminishing returns in uh, productivity alone. And so much of the effort um, in designing new languages nowadays isn't about raw productivity. Um, it's about uh, reducing the cost of maintenance and the um, costs that you get when components of your software interact in unpredicted and unpleasant ways. And 
This goes back to the 1960s. Again, you'll get the details in your programming languages course. There's a famous paper by Edsger Dijkstra in 1968, Go To Considered Harmful, which argued in favour of structured programming. Uh, this came along with Niklaus Wirth's launch of Pascal in 1971, which we were using at scale in industry by the mid-1980s, and that gave you information hiding plus proper control structures. At the same time, there was early research work on object-oriented languages, um, Simula and Smalltalk, again, you'll hear about in your programming languages course, and by the 1990s, uh, people started using um, languages such as C++ and Java in all sorts of projects. But as you go through the details of this in your programming languages course, don't forget that the object of all of this is to manage complexity and to reduce the amount of money that you have to spend on maintaining the code after you've written it. And um, as you will recall from the software e economics uh, segment, uh, that's actually an awful lot more of the work um, than writing the code in the first place. There's then the issue of the development environment and how long it takes you um, to craft some code, um, compile it, test it, and observe that it's not working and debug it and fix it. Now, when I first learned to program, it was at the Glasgow Schools Computer Centre in 1972, when I was uh, 15. And um, we had access to the school's computer centre once a week for a couple of hours after school. We had to go into a coding room where they had machines that would enable us to type lines of Fortran code into punch cards. So each line of the program was one, one punch card. And you put your um, program together and you then queue it up uh, with your program in your hand. This is where the, the idea of a queue in an operating system comes from. It's a queue of schoolboys holding um, bunches of uh, stack, stacks of punch cards. And you would hand your punch cards to the operator who would slap some cards of job control language on the front of it, which would engage what passed for an operating system in the machines of the day. And you would then stand in line to collect your output from the printer at the other side of the room. And then when you found that you were getting the wrong answers, you'd have to scratch your head and figure out what was going wrong. And you'd learn that you had to put lots of scaffolding into your program, lots of print this, print that, and so on, and work out what your debugging plan was if you were ever going to get there um, at all. And even so, in a two-hour session, you might manage to have two or three or four um, goes around the test, um, debug, fix, recom recompile test cycle. So it was very, very slow uh, doing programming in those days. When I came up to Cambridge as a maths undergraduate in uh, 1974, because they didn't have computer science in those days, uh, we got to program on a PDP-11 on the Department of Applied Maths Basement. And um, that was great because you had a terminal, you had a number of terminals in a room and you could sit at the terminal and you could type in your code you could compile it, you could look at the output, you could scratch your head, and you could go around the test, debug, fix, recompile test cycle in a couple of minutes, rather than maybe um, half an hour or so, uh, which we used to take at school. Then we got integrated programming environments. Turbo Pascal was the uh, game changer for personal computers in the mid-80s, and IBM produced something called TSS for its mainframes. And the idea there was that you would have a number of windows open, so you could simultaneously have the source code open. Uh, you could have your um, input data, you could have your output data, you could have uh, logs and various other bits and pieces. And each time you ran the program, um, you could, in some sense, see what was happening. And so you could zero in on bugs an awful lot more quickly. And over time, these started to develop into what was called computer-aided software engineering tools. Um, tools which not only had a development environment, but also had hooks into word processors which would hold your um, uh, requirements, your specification, your test plan, and so on, so that what you were doing could be integrated with what other people in the team were doing. Another thing that was developed during the 20th century is formal methods. Now, uh, pioneers such as Alan Turing talked to the possibility of pro proving programs correct, and a number of people did this, including uh, Tony Hoare, who was headed the Oxford Computer Lab for many years and now lives in Cambridge. Um, he came up with communicating sequential processes, among other things. Um, the Computer Lab's um, own contributions included Hall, the higher order language for verifying hardware, and the Isabel Theorem Prover, which was developed by um, Professor Larry Paulson. 
and these tools are useful for finding subtle bugs, especially in conceptually difficult tasks such as the design of security protocols or um, handoff protocols for radio communication. Um, but there are basically two approaches to formal methods. The academic approach um, is that you try and find all the bugs in a small program, uh, typically by using um, a fairly complex uh, tool that relies on mathematical logic. The industrial approach is very often that you try and find many of the bugs in a large one. You know that you're never going to be able to uh, get a correctness proof of a 20 million line um, operating system program, but you try and do your best. And on the web page, you'll find a link to this paper, a few billion lines of code later, um, which is by the uh, people who developed uh, the Coverity um, static analysis tool. Now, what Coverity does is troll through large programs in uh, languages such as C and looks for constructs which may be um, serious errors or vulnerabilities. They may um, expose um, the software to stack overflows or the uh, use after freeze or um, other things that people uh, exploit or which can lead to program crashes. And the experience is worth reading because it highlights the trade-offs uh, between um, correctness uh, and software economics. If you take an existing project and you suddenly start running Coverity on it, then all of a sudden you find tens of thousands of bugs that you didn't know you had before. And so your ship date uh, slips by months and you've got to get all hands on deck and go and stare at all these bugs and figure out whether they really are bugs and you really have to fix them. Um, if you start off using a tool like Coverity from the beginning, which is what uh, many software houses now do, um, that's very much better because it stops you um, from making mistakes by highlighting dangerous constructs as you code them. Um, however, whenever Coverity upgrade their product, um, you typically find that you've got hundreds to thousands of uh, potential bugs are highlighted in code that you've already written, uh, and so you've got to go back and check those. So that it gives you an interesting insight into the trade-off uh, between cost and quality. And in different industries, whether you're writing uh, business services or um, safety-critical software, you may want to put the trade-off at a different point.